We're very lucky to have Stefan Harding playing as you all join us for the webinar. He's playing a very beautiful instrument called the Quattro. We're just waiting a little bit longer <laughs> till, till the, yeah, we're just waiting. So keep playing a little bit longer. Keep playing. We're we'll waiting another, another, another half minute. You, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to watch it on her phone. Oh, okay. Welcome to all participants who are joining us. We're just listening to Stefan Harding. He's going to be speaking soon. He's playing this lovely South American instrument called Quattro. And my husband and I have enjoyed listening to him for 30, 30 years. <laughs> 30 years. 30 yeah, years. it must be 30 years. All right, I think now we'll, we'll start. Um, okay. So I want to welcome all our speakers who I hope will join us on screen. And first of all, I want to introduce Henry Coleman, who's working with Local Futures and is going to give us some technical advice and details. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Um, just a couple of things. So there's the chat box, obviously, for your comments and also lovely if you can introduce um, where you're joining us from and your name. Um, but when you do that, switch from all panelists to all panelists and attendees in that little drop down menu. And that way, everyone will be able to see your chat. So it's switch from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. And then for questions that come in, for questions that you have, um, pop them in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. The Q&A box is at the bottom of the screen below the faces. And so, yeah, as questions come to you, put them in there. Uh, <clears throat> also, just letting everyone know that after this session, we'll be having a, a collaborators call, a World Localization Day collaborators call. Uh, so you can stay on the line for that. There'll be a five minute break in between this panel and that rather different event. So hopefully you're wanting to join for that as well. 
Um, so back to you, Helena, thanks. Thanks. Well, I'm so honored to have very close and dear friends with us tonight. Uh, as I just mentioned, we've known Stefan for more than 30 years, and I've been enjoying close collaboration with Manish Jain for many years, and Ella is a new friend and collaborator. So welcome to all three of you. And first of all, let me introduce Stefan, who will we'll have a brief 10 minute presentation from each speaker. And I'll add a few words and then we'll have a bit of a discussion and then hopefully Q&A after that. So Stefan is, has been the founding academic at Schumacher College. For those of you who haven't heard of Schumacher College, you should be sure to look it up. It's a very important center for holistic science. And Stefan has been the academic in charge of that masters in holistic science for years. He is one of the greatest ecologists, I think, in the world, who has a deep knowledge, but also such a deep love of nature. And I, I look forward to hearing your presentation today. We're talking about the way home, returning to nature. And I say, I think you agree, one of the ways that we must change the dominant path is towards a decentralization or localization that allows us to become more embedded in the natural world. You're on mute, Stefan. Stefan, you're on mute. So do you want me to do the talk now or are you going to introduce yes, our please. other friends? No, no if you do, do now. talk now, yeah. Okay. So do now. Okay, thank you, Helen. That was a lovely introduction. So let me, I've just got a few slides to show you. So don't worry, I won't, I won't, go take, I won't take more than 10 minutes. So let's share that. Can you see that, everyone? Yes. Okay, deep ecology, local culture. Helena asked me to talk about deep ecology in relation to localization. So that's what I'm going to do. Because deep ecology is an extremely important sort of idea, if you like. It originates from a Norwegian philosopher also a great friend of Helena and all of us, you know, a philosopher, you could say, of localization to, to, to some extent, Arne Ness. Um, he coined the term deep ecology. So let's deconstruct that term and see what it consists of. The two words, ecology. Now, we all think we know what ecology is, but actually it comes from science, the kind of science I did. I'm a scientific ecologist. And that is, ecology is the rational, quantitative, scientific study of the relationships between organisms with each other and with their surroundings. So Arnie pointed out, this is all great, but it only gives us facts. It only gives us facts. It doesn't tell us how we should relate to um, the facts themselves. For example, here I, outside my house, I may have say a lovely population of blackbirds and I know how many there are and how much, how many earthworms they eat and all of that. But how am I going to relate to them? Should I kill them and eat them? Should I ignore them? Should I regard them as a pest? You see, the, the science gives us no, um, no guidance about how to relate about our relationship with the blackbirds or with, the, with nature. So Arnie said to do that, we need to put the word deep in front of ecology. See, deep ecology. So there's a kind, different kind of ecology now. We're still using the scientific facts, which you know the science has given us about climate change, about biodiversity and all these other things. But now with the word deep, we're introducing values. Now values have got nothing to do with thinking. It's all to do with your heart, with your feeling. And he says we should put those together, values and facts, deep ecology. And then we get not ecology, but what he calls wisdom or ecological wisdom or ecosophy. So if we put values and facts together about nature and our relationship to nature, we get deep ecology, not just scientific ecology, but something deeper, which actually gives us wisdom, um, which he called an ecosophy, ecological wisdom. And a key aspect of that wisdom, we're going to argue, is that you have to localize your economies and your way of life. You have to. Um, in a rational analysis will show us that, will convince us of that. So that's deep ecology, the word of it. I mean, the word. And I think there's three aspects of this word deep in deep ecology. One is deep experience, and that's deep experience of connection with nature. You could call that spiritual experience. I, I'm happy to call it that. 
beyond words, beyond understanding, this deep love and connection and, uh, with nature, incredibly healing feeling and, and adoration and divinity, if you like, of nature, which is beyond words. See, I'm grasping for words, but there are no words for it. That's what I would call deep experience. But in deep ecology, that's not enough. You have to question how I have to question how I live in relation to that deep experience. How am I living? What am I consuming? Where am I getting all my clothes from? Where am I getting my food from? How far from how far? you start questioning? Where is it coming from? What's the carbon footprint of my consumption of every item of my consumption? What's the carbon footprint? And when you start doing that, this, this of course brings science and, and reasoning into it. You cannot escape the fact from a totally rational point of view that the mainstream local eco um, global economy is wrecking the planet. I mean, it's not a matter of heart, it's a matter of thought. I mean, you can, you can demonstrate it with the data. So you start questioning, I start questioning my lifestyle in relation to a deep experience I've had, say in the woods, deeply questioning, hey, how am I living in relation to that sacredness I felt in the woods? And inevitably through the deep questioning process, you will have to agree that localizing is the only way to live consistently with your deep experience. You can't wriggle out of it. I mean, you, you know, the arguments are well pinned down. You cannot escape. Then the next aspect of deep comes spontaneously. If this, if this deepening process is process of discovering your own ecosophy, your own wisdom, your own ecological wisdom, if it's really genuine and happening properly, you will make a deep commitment. A feeling of deep commitment will arise in you. And you'll, you'll say to yourself, I want to, I'm for this wonderful planet Gaia. And I know the only way to be for her and to help her and to help nature and humanity is to localize. It's the only way the, the deep questioning has shown me that. So now I make a deep commitment in my life to do something, do some action, something peacefully and democratically. And that deepens my experience. Next time I go out to the woods or down to the beach or wherever I may be in nature or sit with my houseplant Suddenly in my experience, I noticed getting deeper, you know, calmer, deeper, more confident in accessing this, this sense of the sacredness of nature. And my questioning now becomes deeper as well. I might go into very deep questions. Um, and then my commitment gets deeper. But in the meantime, I'm always active. You know, I'm, I may be supporting my local farmer's market. Um, I may be helping with some conservation efforts. I may be doing all sorts of things that local, I may be building local culture, playing music at my village hall for, a, for an evening with the local people, you know, mm. instead of sitting in front of the television or listening to Spotify, we make live music. That's deep commitment. We create community with each other and with nature, but I'm, I commit to doing it. I don't just think about it. I do it. I go out and I'm with my friends or I, I help the farmer's market. I grow tomatoes to sell in the farmer's market. I make clothes, whatever. Something local. Deep commitment to the local. And by deeply committing to the local, you're also deeply committing to the, to the global, to Gaia, to the, to the planet, to the planetary ecosystem. And when we do that, can you see already we can feel our wisdom is growing. You know, we get more ecosophy. We're growing our own personal ecosophy, not off the shelf ecosophy my own one, individual one. So deep experience, just very briefly. Nature, you need nature for deep experience. This is a Arnie's, Arnie Ness's mountain in Norway where he had a cabin. Doesn't have to be, I mean, this is magnificent, isn't it? Look at that. If you've got access to such places, go there and be there and just feel the, the immense wisdom in the mountain itself, in nature itself. It doesn't have to be a mountain, you know, it can be a house plant, a house plant, a marvelous, marvelous miracle. So even if you're locked in your apartment in Brazil, I had students who've been locked in their apartment in Brazil because of the virus. They, they, their place was a, a plant, house plant. So I call this a Gaia place, a place where you can cultivate your deep experience, uh, where, where Gaia can show herself to you, where things can be, she reveals things, reveals herself to you reveals her magnificence, opens up your awareness to the absolute miracle of her existence in the first place. And it can be very humble. It doesn't have to be a, a mountain or a wonderful beach in Australia. It can be just planting some house plants where you are. Um, every speck of life is, is a miracle. Every bacterium, everything, is a every living being is a miracle. So 
a plant is a miracle, that'll do. If you spend time with a plant, you'll properly, you'll discover great things. And here's Arne. Um, he would say, the smaller we come to feel ourselves compared to the mountain, or let's say to Gaia, the nearer we come to participation in its greatness. Um, so in a way, the smaller we come to feel ourselves compared to Gaia, we become, we become more local, you know, the more local, you could rephrase this, the more local we come to feel ourselves in relation to Gaia, the nearer we come to participating in her greatness. I think that's a good way of rephrasing that, yeah? The, the, uh, I won't repeat it, but you get the idea. So by, by becoming local ecologically, you become global ecologically. You, you tune in to the whole planet. Um, and the deep questioning I've just mentioned, um, now if you want to get a little bit more technical, out of the deep questioning come, come these various, these eight points that Arnie, sorry, it's all gone berserk, berserk now. Um, oh, right. Something says the screen sharing has stopped as a shared window has closed. Oh, never mind. Sorry about that. It's my computer going a bit bonkers here. Um, all right, well, I've lost the slides. It doesn't matter though. Let me let me stop the share uh, if I can. Um, so um, I don't know if you can see me or you can't see me. Helen Norberg Hodge, the whiteboard. Okay. We can see so, you, Stefan. We can and you can see me. Okay, that's good. So all right, so that was deep, deep questioning. So out of the deep questioning come come these eight points that Arnie talked about. One of them is that all life has intrinsic value. And then this, it goes on to say that we are disturbing the intrinsic value of life and the intrinsic in uh, the diversity of life. So to change that, we need to we need to change our, our politics, our ideology, and everything the way we do everything. And I've mentioned this already. So this brings us to localization. Um, uh, and then deep commitment. Well, um, the deep commitment. Uh, I've also mentioned, so we can think of the whole ecosophical move, if you like, uh, like a tree. Th think of the image of a tree. So down in the roots, we have deep experience. You know, when we go down to the beach and we spend, we feel really connected with the ocean or we're in the forest, then we're in the roots of the tree. We're deep in the soil of Gaia, deep in the roots. And the roots go everywhere. I mean, the roots cover a large area, which means there's all kinds of deep experiences that, we, that people can have, very diverse, they're very diverse. There isn't just one kind of deep experience of connection with Gaia, with nature, with the universe. There's many, many different kinds. Some involve God, some don't involve God, and we have to respect each other's different kinds of accessing to the realm um, of the soil of the tree, you know, to the nutrients, the deep nutrients that are in the soil, in this metaphor of the tree, the deep ecosophical tree then all these roots come together in the trunk. And the trunk is a sort of rational analysis of the implications. It's the deep questioning, the implications of what, we're, uh, what, what this means for the way we live. And as I said, the implication is that we have to localize. I mean, there's no way out of it. Then the branches come out of the tree. Um, and that's relating to deep commitment because each branch is a possibility for a way of life. You know, there are many different ways of life in which we could be local. Um, in which could help Gaia by localizing many different ways. As I mentioned, food growing close. We need everything made locally as much as possible. We can't have everything made locally, but, but that's a discussion for later. But we need to localize as much as we can, everything, all our manufacturing, everything. And then there are many different ways of achieving that, of doing that, many different lifestyles involved in doing that. And then finally, a fruit is when you as an individual choose to act in a certain way. That's the fruit at the end of a branch, you know? You've gone from your deep experience through questioning your lifestyle, choosing a root, a branch into a lifestyle, then you actually enact the lifestyle. You get a fruit. When the fruit is ripe, it falls to the ground and it rots and it fertilizes the soil for everybody. And of course, there's a new little tree or a little plant, little tree growing up. Another little e bit of ecosophy is developing um, somewhere else. So. Um, we can think of the, just finish now. That's all I want to say, really. We just think of deep ecology as a tree. The tree is a very deep archetypal image. It's a good image. So to cultivate our ecosophy is to become local. To become local is to become wise ecologically. And 
to do this, we can use um, the metaphor of a tree. We think of deep experience as the roots. We have to have roots. Our roots are in our deep experience. We can't be local unless we're deeply rooted in our experience, in our local place, something in our local place, something of nature. Then we come together in the trunk of the ecosophical tree. Then we discuss what's required to do things. And we realize that we must localize. Then in the branches of the ecosophical tree, we choose a lifestyle, a fruit appears, we enact it and the action falls to the ground and fertilizes the deep experience for everyone. So that's, that's how I think we can relate uh, deep ecology with localization. They're both basically um, inextricably linked. Okay, Thank thanks. Thank you so much, Stefan. Thank you. We'll have a chance to discuss more because we, no, not, there's so much to talk about, as you said. Um, um, and I just wanna make the point that there's a big, big difference between identifying with Gaia, the global, Mother Earth of Gaia and the global economic system. They're antithetical, but I hope that will become obvious. So now I'd like to introduce another dear friend, Manish Jain, who is the founder of Shikshanta, which is the People's Institute for Rethinking Education and Development. Manish arrived at this having graduated from Harvard, worked with the UN, and realizing how little he had really learned. And he went back to learn from his illiterate grandmother in Rajasthan. And he's also been the, the founder of Swaraj University, which is an alternative university and the convener of the Ecoversities Network. All of these are very interesting. And I hope that you'll be, be looking them all up on, online. Manish. Like, where are you? You ready to start? Yes, yes. Thank you, Helena. So, um, I uh, hello everyone. Happy World Localization Day. Uh, and it's really uh, great to be with you today. I would just like to, before I speak, invite everyone uh, to um, let's laugh together for, uh, for 10 seconds. And I would like you to wiggle, wiggle your fingers a little. Can everyone put their fingers up and wiggle them? Send a little magic and a love and gratitude and appreciation for all the people here and all the people around the world who are celebrating World Localization Day. Okay, so let's laugh on the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> I want to just, the, the reason people might think I'm a little bit mad for laughing, but just the laugh, laughter is, is very important for us um, health-wise and um, uh, emotion-wise. And also, I think that reminder that this movement is fundamentally about uh, joy, will bring more joy in our lives, more connection in our lives. And I think that's it. Um, you know, in, in the Jain tradition, which I'm part of, uh, we actually say less is more. So there's a whole thing that if we if we, uh, you know, degrow or reduce consumption or everything, we'll be missing out. But actually, the localization movement is actually uh, really helping us to create more joy and happiness uh, in our lives. So um, let me start with um, basically saying that I uh, don't believe that we can grow the localization movement or find our way home and unless we radically reimagine education. Uh, what I actually call the global education system, what I call uh, make education for all. Um, the, the design, uh, 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 there is a fundamental problem with the design of, of school systems of what we call factory schools. The purpose of it, uh, in India, they're quite blatant. It's the Ministry of Human Resource Development. So the purpose is to really create economic slaves to feed the global economy. And... Um, I think, uh, so, so part of, that's a really a core of my work is how do we reimagine? And the problem with the challenge that we're in there is that one of the objectives of schooling is actually to kill our imagination. One of my friends from Africa had used this term that we face the 500 years of the systematic rape of our imaginations. So we, this whole movement of localization is actually a call to something also to reimagine something more deeper, profound, a lot of things that Stefan was re referring to. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that I would uh, just like to say is that, you know, there's a lot of um, 
discussion these days around um, uh, blaming humanity for the world's problems. And I really want to say that we need to, it's time to move on. If we want to find our way home, we have to stop blaming humanity and really look at the underlying global systems and the financial systems that are really the source of things. Uh, so um, I wanted to uh, say that during the COVID times, we've actually witnessed a new story, a uh, new chapter in factory schooling. And I wanted to share two little stories around that. Um, one is um, actually a few days ago, I was talking to an old colleague of mine from UNESCO and he was telling me that he was doing research around uh, what he was calling lost learning during COVID. So all the people who missed out on education and didn't have access to, to uh, digital devices, you know, what happened to them? Um, so I started thinking about this term lost learning. I'm like, what were those people doing? So, so many things actually were happening that I wondered how could it be called lost? Uh, they were cooking good food together, fresh food together. They were spending time with their families. They were fixing things, learning how to fix things around the house. They were taking care of the silly, sick and elderly. Uh, they were playing music like Stefan. Um, they were taking care of their animals. They were exercising. They were dealing with household conflicts. They were meditating. They were um, uh, growing food. They were uh, grieving the loss of dear ones. They were actually learning how to make their houses into homes again, how to actually make their homes into neighborhoods again. And I think this is very profound, but apparently all of these rich experiences were a waste of time when it comes to education uh, because they did not contribute to the GNP, the gross national product of India. So uh, this was one, one little thing I wanted to reflect upon. And the second thing was um, uh, what was contributing to the GNP, a, a story. So just as we've seen the rise of fake food, fake seeds, fake fertilizers, we, need, we, we now see the rise of more and more fake education. During COVID, we saw the rise of huge profits of the global ed tech industry. We have seen millions of innocent children forced to sit in front of screens for six, seven, eight hours a day for online classes. It was in fact a huge human rights violation that was occurring against these children. And yet, all of the teachers, most of the teachers in the world remained conspicuously silent about it. They just played along because if they questioned it, it might, it might challenge the profits of the schools. Um, one example, or I should say one of the most hideous examples of this was the new ed tech, ed tech star White Hat Jr., which emerged on the scene last year selling coding classes to six and seven year olds. In the last one year, White Hat, has, uh, White Hat Jr. has signed up over 700,000 students in just, uh, just a short amount of time. They use advertising like this fictitious story of a kid named Wolf Gupta. His age keeps on changing in the advertising between age 9 and 14, and his salary that he earned after he learned coding in their classes is from $250,000 to $2 million to up to $30 million. Uh, and to some people, it might be a normal marketing gimmick, but most people would con agree that it is not acceptable to target uh, uh, consumers when they're six years old. The company also recent, uh, the recent ad, TV ad campaigns shows parents who are happily viewing a chaotic scene of investors squabbling into invest in Wolf's app which he built after learning coding on White Hat Jr. Um, it's interesting that White Hat Jr. made its debut during the Indian uh, IPL Cricket League this year, uh, last year, um, using the cricketing extravaganza to drive awareness and brand growth in global markets. Uh, White Hat Jr. was recently acquired by EdTech BMS Baijus for $300 million. So this is considered to be learning. And um, what I want to say is that uh, we are really looking at this, this new chapter and I would love, you know, I think we need to have 
you know, uh, much more conversations about, you know, this ed tech and this online world and what it represents for learning and education. Um, in Swaraj University, I think I would just want to talk about briefly that. Uh, one of the ways home, I think we talk a lot about the need for unlearning, unlearning the culture of schooling, unlearning the monoculture of the mind, unlearning the fantasies that have been sold to us by the global economy. And um, I wanted to share some of the things I think we need to unlearn. So we need to unlearn Tina, there is no alternative. GNP is the ultimate monoculture mindsets and the myth of technological progress and technological utopianism. Uh, in education, we need to unlearn the fear of money and the dependency on the global financial system for meeting our basic needs. We need to unlearn the definitions of who is educated, who is developed, who is wealthy, and who is powerful. We need to unlearn the inner voice of constant comparison and competition and the idea that more and more consumption and stuff will lead to more and more happiness and respect. We need to unlearn our dependence on big experts, global institutions, fossil fuel resources, and the West to solve our problems. We need to unlearn our uh, conditioned disdain of the local as being dirty, unhygienic, unsafe, unorganized, inefficient, backwards, superstitious, unproductive. All of this we need to unlearn. And lastly, we need to unlearn the individualist isolated self and, I, and the idea that we are separate from the soil, the trees, the rivers, the mountains, the desert, deserts, the forests, the animals, the seeds, even the bacteria. We need to re remember that what we do to them, we do to ourselves. This unlearning journey does not only happen at the level of intellect or PowerPoint presentations, but involves, it must intricately involve our hands, our hearts, our cells, our relationships, our ancestors. My village grandmother uh, and her grandmother's university has been critical to my own unlearning journey and to finding my way back home. So I think that, you know, we have been supporting uh, the Ecoversities Alliance uh, over the last five years, which is really an alliance of people who are reimagining education and trying to uh, reclaim the wisdom of our bodies, the wisdom of our hands, of our hearts, of our ancestors, of our land. And I just wanted to share a recent story also that uh, basically, you know, schooling, uh, you know, we've heard of the farmer suicide. So I wanna talk about the farmers murders that are happening in India. And when any child who goes to school, his dream of becoming a farmer, how it gets murdered. There was one, one of my uh, students uh, was recently telling me, he, he did a college degree, he walked out of that, he decided to, uh, joined Swaraj University, and he, um, he he decided his passion really was around food, farming, reforestation, agroecology, and he went to tell, very excitedly started learning all this. When he went home to tell his parents, they were super upset because they feared poor marriage prospects for their son because he was now doing farming, which was seen as manual labor and uh, very much beneath them. So this is not just a story of one student, but I think this is a story of all over. And we need to really um, reclaim the, the farming and food, not as only, you know, something that is part of localization, but is an intellect, is fundamentally a, an activity which, which, which really uh, evolves our intelligence, which evolves our spirit, which, involve, which evolves. You know, the whole idea of labor has to be reclaimed uh, from from uh, uh, as part of the, the localization agenda. So um, in conclusion, I think that we might have to um, let ourselves get a little bit lost again, as in the lost learning, if we want to find our way home again. So thank you so much, Elena. Thank you, Manish. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Ella, who's an indigenous leader, as young as she is, 
and who's been playing a wonderful role in among several native groups here, indigenous groups, trying to bring them together. And she's a mentor to many youth. And she has started a project called The Returning, which helps women of all backgrounds come back home to community and nature. So I feel very, very close to your efforts. They are very much about the sort of coming home that we're talking about today or tonight, depending on where you are. So thank you, Ella, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I am a descendant of the Bundjalung peoples of the northern New South Wales region of Australia. Um, I also have bloodlines to Scotland and England and just want to take a moment to pay respects to the sacred lands in which I'm sitting on today and extend that to all the sacred lands around the globe and where we're all sitting on today. And in that, I hope that we can remember that in a deep acknowledgement in the way that we use our words, we can find that point of connection or that path to going home. I woke up this morning on my birthday and did what I have done for so long, which is open my eyes and want to look for my brother or call him. Um, it's also his birthday. Um, we have shared our birthdays for, since I was born and he's three years older, so he did get a couple of years without me. But while thinking about the idea and concepts of connecting, I started to realize how today I kept saying our birth, our birthday. And not only is it my birthday and my brother's birthday, but it's also our mother's birthday as it's the day that she birthed us. And in this point of reflection, I, I start to think about how we're all born into this world and how perhaps even before education, is where we need to start radically changing the way that our modern cultures bring us into the world. Because for me, I see the disconnect happens at birth, at that beginning point of birth. And a lot of that is through um, Western medical intervention. It's also through our stories as women and men being cut from us, our knowledge on our own bodies of how we can birth and raise our children. And when I start to reflect on that part of all of our lives, it gives me great hope because it's almost like a challenge that has been given to us as we walk on the lands disconnected that we have a purpose here. And that one purpose is to do everything in our body and being to reconnect back to the world around us. And when I was thinking about our birthday, our birthday, I started to think a lot about collective language and how English is very limiting. And also the words we speak become our reality and cast the spells of the way that our world develops around us. And that perhaps what we're missing is more collective language in order to just start that path. And collective language is me instead of we instead of me or I instead of us. And I feel like when we move away from the individual and we start to use language that brings us together to our natural world and to the humans around us, we start to live from this place. For me, I feel like my, my own relationship with reconnecting back to the world has not been one that I can do by myself. And that is why I birthed The Returning, which is a, the indigenous charity in which is all female led and it's all indigenous led. And it is a prayer and a hope that by bringing community back to land and women specifically to talk about things like birth, to talk about things like local food systems, to talk about the importance of us regaining our relationship to the natural world where we craft and we sing and we dance and we pray. It is a small offering, 
but what I have actually realized in the, the creation of of the returning is how little we actually need to start relying on money and the big global economic system when we actually are connected to our community because this project has given me an opportunity to make deep relations not only with the earth around me um, but with all of the women and families and children who come and attend our weekend gatherings and that has for me catalyst a life that doesn't rely solely on the monetary system for survival because I know that my community will always look after me because I in turn am wanting to look after them and I think this is the mindset that for me we must start moving towards we must start to try and dismantle these individualistic concepts which we've created because on this nation on this landmass in which I sit currently prior to 1788 there was never individual language spoken and so this land it hears collective language and it responds to it and I always say you know the biggest disease they brought over on the boats other than smallpox was the English language and the the mindset and concepts of individualism which has disconnected us so much from our truth um, you know that being said I am embarking on the next year of my life with a deep desire to connect and the way that I'm doing that is to question in every moment of the day when I'm wanting to connect to something, I'm asking myself, am I connecting to something that has been made by man or am I connecting to the magical world of what mother nature has provided? Because they're two di very different connections. One I see as false and the other one I see as our portal to return home, to return to a life of magic and deep abundance and infinite love. Um, so I invite you to, if you want to join this journey with me, to ask yourself if you're needing to connect from this day on to see that could be pulling your bare feet in the soil or in the sand or in the sea, if you have that opportunity. It could be having a house plant that you spend time with, that you develop deep relation. It could be checking whether the food that you're eating is coming from the land that you're sitting on or at least close to. And, you know, if there is something that is packaged there is something that it is fresh. And so if we can go for that fresh alternative, that is us connecting again to something that is straight from the mother. And I really do believe that through connectiveness, we will find the return of our health, both spiritually, physically, and mentally. But I also know that in healing ourselves, we will hear the world and when we want to connect with her deeply the way that all beings on this earth used to connect with her she will connect with us it takes patience like any good relationship and anybody who has a mother in their life will know it takes deep listening patience respect quality time and a lot of love and so i'm going forward with that in my heart for the next part of my life and I would love to see you in the forest there one day. That was beautiful, Ella. Thank you. Thank you. And oh, I have so much I want to say, but just on that note of language, I want to let people know that in the indigenous culture that I lived in for many years, which is Ladakh or Western Tibet, another aspect of the language that's so important is that it brought with it deep humility and an understanding of the limits of our knowledge. And it paid 
great respect to experiential knowledge. And we have to remember experiential knowledge is full bodied experience of something. In modern English, we can use the same verb. We can say it is like this. And whether we're talking about the grass right under our feet, you know, the grass under my feet is green. And then we use the same verb is when we talk about in China, it is like this. Now in this ancient indigenous language, it's impossible to say that. You have to use affixes that show that you're basically saying, it is said that on the other side of the world, it is supposedly like this. But always that humility in the face of things that you haven't experienced. Western knowledge has turned that upside down and made experiential knowledge anecdotal, insignificant. Just like it, this economic system has made mothering, parenting, and growing food also anecdotal, shadow work, insignificant. In many cases, you know, farmers don't even register in the census. So this is why we focus a lot on this relationship between parents and children and the foundational sense of identity that benefits from having many caretakers for every child. Now, this is something that was true in all indigenous cultures. It was true in, in even traditionally, even in Europe until not so long ago, there was that much deeper connection in a more extended family fabric. And once you have a more extended family, the, the, the barrier between blood and family and others is not so thick, it's permeable. Whereas in the nuclear family, which is a consequence of this economic system that has been taking us further and further from nature and from one another, that system is what has created the nuclear family and what has created with it these very thick walls of fear, fear to be ourselves, fear to be imperfect. So one of the foundational sort of ideas in terms of coming back home is to be able to be vulnerable, to be able to be imperfect with others. So one of the things that's happening, there is a, there is a trend throughout the world, which of course we're, we're naming it broadly as localization, and it's all the time people trying to reconnect and one of the aspects of that is people sitting in circle, coming together in community groups, human scale groups, maybe 20 people, to deeply exchange, to try to develop a deeper sense of interdependence and connection. And that is, in order to do that, we have to be willing to be vulnerable. We have to be willing to be imperfect. Now, another foundational and, and um, equally important aspect to the whole localization movement is that rebuilding of local food systems. And I just want to stress that once we get the food system right, we're actually talking about looking after water. We're talking about afforestation. We're talking about a healing that is so much broader than we realize because we don't have enough information about the global food economy. So we have not been informed that it's the biggest contributor to climate change, to mountains of plastic, to a decimation of biodiversity, to the factory farming, which is cruel and toxic, to the antibiotics, which are now threatening our health. We're talking about virtually every every single issue that is part of this multitude of serious crises we face connected to the global food system. So shrinking the food economy by shortening the distance between production and consumption is one of the most important things we can do. So I don't, I don't um, want to add anything more right now. I want to hear if any of you have questions of any of the other speakers, or if you can add 
something a little bit more to what you what you've already saying if there's something you want to add i want to i want to add one thing which is that i do recommend stefan's book animate earth um mm -hmm. so for people who haven't heard of that animate earth as you can hear is about mm -hmm. recognizing that the earth is alive and what what ella and stefan were both talking about this coming closer to life is becomes a celebration and what Manish was saying this is why it's the economics of happiness for those of you who don't know about it that's the name of our film um, from local futures and it's the economics of localization which is the economics of happiness because once we find our way home to reconnecting to one another and to reconnecting to the rest of life we heal and we experience ourselves as alive and we, we experience ourselves as whole and worthy and lovable. And that's a prerequisite for being loving and caring and respectful of the other. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a win, win, win healing journey. And it is a journey that actually from almost the first step starts strengthening our, our sense of, of commitment, energy, and joy. So I, I urge all of you to join us on this journey back home to happiness. Elena, can I add something? Please. Just around the concept of returning to our food systems, you know, upon reflection, it's like as human beings, there's very little that we need in order to be happy. Food, shelter, water and some sort of social status or connection within our community yet it's like we are all working for this thing this money to get these things that are provided in the natural world around us and you know many indigenous cultures around the world there's no such concept as work you know the idea of sitting at your desk for eight hours a day is um, nothing that ha ever happened and when we look at modernity or the modern world and the global world it is so responsible for our our ill health in many ways because you can imagine that nature and the way that the world worked pre this big global system was that people were crafting every day you know they were fishing every day they were on the beach maybe every day now these are things that we get told we can only do now in holidays or as extracurricular activities this is the way that we live as human beings and how we deserve to live on this planet to um, ensure that the next generations can do that too yeah and I'm sure, Manish, you've also seen evidence of that, even in some of India today, that people are, actually have more time to dance, to sing, to enjoy, and that the majority are not yet wage slaves in the same way. Yes. Um, I totally agree with, with, with what you're saying. I wanted to just share a little bit of, you know, one of the um, very special um, festivals that we have in India. I'm just reminded, hearing Ella reminded me of that. Uh, it's called Raksha Bandhan or Raki. And it's a, it's the, the, it has been, I would say, um, when I grew up with it, it was, it was a kind of um, festival between brothers and sisters. And you could tie a Raki, uh, a thread, sacred thread every year on, on your sister Sorry, our sister would tie it on our brother, and there was a kind of celebration of mutual care, respect. But when I came to my grandmother, and I started seeing, uh, you know, we were tying it on my sister and I, uh, but I saw my grandmother going outside. She started tying this thread on a tree, on the trees outside, on the animals, and uh, on on the uh, even on the gate, or and I've seen people even tying it on their motorcycles or. Um, so it's a very safe sense of sacred respect for all of the, the, the beings, the objects around us and how they, uh, we, they take care of us and we take care of them together in a kind of very sacred relationship. And I think that these kinds of, you know, um, small reminders and, you know, in India, there's also this saying, Vasudev Kutumbukam, the entire world is our family. And with the Rocky thread, you can actually tie a thread on any being and 
declare them, uh, mutually declare them as your brother or your sister. So as a human being or, or more than human being. And I think this is, these kinds of things are very powerful reminders that uh, we, we are still connected and uh, there is a larger um, expansive sense of self that we, can, that we can just easily access again if we, if we want to. And uh, we haven't lost ourselves so badly that we cannot access that. So just wanted to share that. Can I say something? Yes, please. I, yeah, I this think is what I've learned, I mean, thank you very much for this conversation. I have to say, first of all, I've been learning an, a great deal. What, what I've learned and I, uh, is that the importance for us Westerners um, to learn from indigenous cultures, because what both of you have just said is tremendous wisdom from indigenous cultures. If I hadn't heard what you've told me, I couldn't have, it would have been very hard for me to access that sensitivity we're talking about. It's very hard to find it within Western culture. I mean, I don't want to be down on Western culture. It's there, you know, and Wordsworth and the alchemists had it, of course. But um, when you talk about those things from Australia, from India, it, in me, it awakens this wonderful aboriginality, which is an immediate sense of understanding and connecting with what you mean. So I, I realize that part of the unlearning, Manish, I would say, is to learn the immense value of those practices. For example, the Rocky Thread practice that you've just mentioned, what that does to you psychologically to learn that, or what it means, Ella, you know, to really be a skilled fisher person out on the beach, you know, looking, really looking after your nets, listening to the ocean. Um, that's a sort of unlearning. In other words, we need to learn more respect for indigenous cultures. That's a, that's a rather crude way of putting it. We have to learn, unlearn our culture to some extent and learn indigenous cultures. So we become indigenous. And then, of course, opens up a big question, which we haven't, probably haven't got time to go into, uh, which is what's the role of the Western? What's, our West, what's the West's con contribution to this? I mean, it can't have been a total waste of time, you know, this whole business that we discovered science and all of that. That, I, I don't believe that, you see. I think that's part of the picture. Science is part of the, I'm a scientist, you know. Science, what we call science is part of the picture. So we have to be careful not to throw out everything from the West. What is it from the West that's equivalent to the Rocky thread and the crafting, you know, of Aboriginal people doing we're doing what's what's what do we have to what we have something to offer here uh, I, I would it's... argue Stefan yeah. I think I think we should be aware as with everything that things are changing constantly so one of our problems is that you know in order to understand things we try to hold them static so when we uh -huh. talk about the west uh -huh. I see it in the west we see these two forks in the road or what is it a fork in the road after mm -hmm. COVID and some from within the West, there is an increasing, a rapidly increasing thirst, hunger for uh -huh. coming back home to nature. And we can uh -huh. see this yeah. through the growing respect for indigenous culture, which is yeah. very clear and, and global yeah. within the industrialized world. Uh -huh. So I would argue that if science had something to offer, if the basic principle of testing our hypothesis made sense, this is something that is, doesn't have to be a contradiction, but we have to be very careful that we don't go along with the fork and the other fork right now, which is being pulled. We're all being pulled in the direction of ever more energy consumption for ever larger mega technological structures mass urbanization, which is a mass step towards taking us further away from nature. And with every step increasing per capita consumption on a crowded planet. And this factory education Manish is talking about yeah. was the yeah. training for urban living. So yeah, yeah. we need to be looking at the walk in the road and we need to be looking at the science, which is yeah. beginning to prove that we need to go home. The yeah. science that shows that our nervous systems need it. Um, I had a lovely conversation with Gabor Mate, who is so clear about the fact that 
when we left our home, a more localized, embedded, localized is more indigenous way of living, we started losing our, our health, both physical and mental. He's very, very clear. We've evolved for that way of life that we're talking about. So we're now seeing a science that is also proving that. Yeah. Yes. If I, just, if I just say the science, I just realized as you were speaking, Helena, the science that we need is ecology. Yeah. That's the, that's the bit of the scientific offering that is, the, is this, what we can offer from science is ecology. And it's so profound, the level of interconnectedness, you know, of, even from a mathematical point of view, it brings you into this, this sense of the but sacred. I, I, yeah. I would say that, that indigenous cultures around the world had ecology and an understanding yeah. of it that was embodied. Exactly. which I think is the difference. I think when we're looking uh -huh. at the Western world and the, say, uh -huh. indigenous world, you think of it like the left brain and the right brain, right? And imagine that the Western brain is the ADHD brain that can't stop thinking and trying to create solutions constantly or is constantly distracted. And then you think of the indigenous brain as one that is stiller, that is mm -hmm. able to sit and be patient and you know, mm -hmm. is also very feminine, if you think about it. But both worlds and both brains need to exist at the same mm -hmm. time. It's not yeah. about dissolving exactly. one. But exactly. what it is, actually, when we're talking about indigeneity, when we're talking about bringing something that the West is, is not got, it is that femininity. It is the slower paced. It's actually getting out of our minds and stop trying to think we have the answers and we can solve them and actually just get into our bodies and start feeling more well but wait ella one thing i think you're right but imagine we're a group of women you know i mean i'm a man but imagine we're sitting in the group of women you're sitting with your group and you hear this concept gaia you know come which come from science you're chewing it over really slow you know this concept from science gaia and you hear, hey, it's about the relationships between all the living organisms and the rocks and the atmosphere and the water and how the whole planet is one gigantic organism, one great living being. This has come from our science. There's nothing- yeah, I'd also argue it's come from psychedelics. I would well, also yeah. say the embodied form of what you're talking about is also deep ceremony, trance-like state, psychedelic, astral, um, astral plane projecting. I think there are different ways. I think I agree with what you're saying, but again, it's, it's looking at it in a, um, it, it's a way that we can comprehend it by the mind. But yeah, the, the, mind, the indigenous the way of doing that is actually to take yeah, something yeah. like a psychedelic plant, for example, right, which right, right. will give you the embodiment of yes. actually realizing that right. you are part of the mycelium as the mycelium is part I of know. you. And then but the wait, whole world. We, yeah, but Ella, we wouldn't know there was a mycelium if it hadn't been for the science. We well, would never I'm have sure the word. That, we'd yes. never know. We'd never know about it. We, we never wouldn't know, know they were what the word is, without, but, you know. but I disagree because I think that when you're connected, you're actually able to, to commune with the natural world. And it's in a way that yeah. maybe not yeah. language can even, the English language most certainly cannot even but understand wait, 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 it. wait. You see, I really have to defend the science. I really, because you wouldn't know there was a fungal, you wouldn't know what a fungal tube was. You would have no idea unless your intuition was so profound. You, in a, in a hallucinogenic journey, you could see the tubes of some sort, but you would never know yeah. that what they were, where they came from, how they evolved. All of that's from the science. And I have to defend that. That has to be aboriginalized. That's it. That has to be made uh, aboriginal but, knowledge. That but knowledge. Stefan, I yeah. actually think if we examine indigenous worldviews, we will uh -huh. find the equivalent of Gaia. In other words, we'll find that most of them understood the inextricable oneness of life. And certainly, yeah. you know, if you go back to Taoism, and if you look at Buddhism, the, the, there are different words. There's a, but essentially, life is one. All of life is one was a, a teaching of most of those cultures. And the, I guess what you're talking about is the belief that the language, you know, now we're speaking in English or Latin science, that that's, 
the only way to describe it, and I think it, this is a very interesting discussion because it wait, wait. could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, not saying, yeah. I'm not saying it's the only way to describe <laughs> it. And I'm not sure if that's what you're saying. I'm saying, and I'm not saying that. I'm yeah. saying that if if we dis disregard that aspect of ourselves, which we've cultivated so much in the West, which we call science, and not the way we do science now, we are going to we won't be whole. We've got to, it's, it's got to be part of it. And there's nothing, you see, it just makes your, your, um, your experience even deeper. Well, I'd like to hear what my niece, my niece, what yeah. you have to I say would, about that. I would like to say a couple of things that uh, I'd offer this. Um, so what concerns me is not science, but the dogma of science, the global dogma of science. Of course, where, of course, uh, yeah. Of and course. I think that, you know, I would, you know, one thing I, sh you know, and, try to share with different learners in our ecosystems is, you know, uh, a deep humility that needs to be there. And one of the ways is that is, you know, I, I try to share some of the greatest blunders of science, you know, like, and, and really saying that science can like the, like the nuclear bomb, for example, That's really good, yeah. and, uh, and, and Einstein being the only, you know, one of the only scientists to apologize that we made a great blunder here with that and that you know these kinds of things or you know the whole you know or you know concentration camps and the you know the gas chambers another great blunder of science you know so i think that you know these these kinds of things need to be much openly more openly discussed and also how science has become very fragmented and people get hyper specialized in their mode without when lose the big picture they wouldn't, very few scientists would be joining a conversation on big picture activism, for right, example. Right. But that's not um, science. I mean, sci yeah, I understand. I'm with you, man. Well, that's, that's the but thing. What science... I'm saying is that that needs to be cleaned up because that's all masking itself as part of the scientific dogma. Okay. And the third thing I just want to say, the link of science to global capitalism now, really, it has become a vehicle of global capitalism. And we need to, again, if you want to keep promoting science and defend it, Stefan, what I would say that we need to clean up these things. Because wait, if of you course keep we do. Wait, 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 wait. Wait. Very few I, have to, I, have to, I have to respond to that. Yeah, okay, but one, one second. Manish, yeah. Manish, did you finish? We should just let Manish finish because Stefan, you have quite a long thought. time before. No, I'm good. I, <laughs> did, I like to you? see Stefan is getting is ready to jump out of his chair. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, but, um, no, no, I'm with you. Or let me just let me respond briefly. Yeah, I'm with you, yeah. Manish, of course. Yeah. I'm talking, but what is science? Science is sitting with a leaf and wondering. Where did you come from? What made you? Where are you from? It's asking those very deep questions of a leaf. And when you do that with the deepest sincerity, you know, not, of course, we know the economy is involved, but with the deep, what do you find? There are chloroplasts, there are cells, there are cells. Inside these cells of the plant, there are chloroplasts. Those chloroplasts were once free living bacteria, 3,500 million years. Wait a minute. I'm discovering deep time here. Just by sitting with a leaf, I'm discovering deep time. And you can feel the level of connection that's, that's, that's possible with this. And I think I we think, need to use yeah. science. That's science. That, yeah. that for me is science. But I also okay. would argue that perhaps science is a little bit behind the times and that actually most scientific knowledge that is coming out, Indigenous people have known just through basically living. You know, it's different to look at a cell and intervene it with medical um, intervention than to see that leaf dancing on the tree and know it is alive because you are seeing and witnessing it through oneness, which is something that we're also limited to, you know, if you know and about neural pathways and the concept of what we're using our brains for in this mod modern world, we we, we don't even comprehend a fraction of the way that we used to think as human beings because part of our, our lights are turned off in our brain and that part is the part that connects us so deeply to the natural world and the one that makes us want to observe it and find the answers to it and not just be in it and accept it. No, I, I think also, I think just one thing, I think we also have to, Stefan, look at when Monsanto invests billions to create mm. genetic engineering, 
this is not a nice little man sitting contemplating a leaf and getting close to it. It's it's the See, what, what you're really. pointing to. You're yeah. all pointing to the shadow. Really you're pointing to the shadow of science. You're right. Science has a big shadow. I'm sure localization could have a big shadow too, if you're not careful. Yes. You know, we could start killing other communities yeah, over there. We really, Henry, I don't see many. You know, there's a shadow in everything. And I think you're pointing to the shadow of science quite rightly, but you're missing what it has to contribute. It's very interesting. You know, I'm a localizer like you, but I do feel a strong anti science, which is understandable. But somehow I'm def I must defend science in, in what it can really <laughs> offer us. You know, otherwise I don't no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not anti-science. I just think it's time for science to sit down and be quiet for a little while. You know, like that science has spoken a little bit too much, and now it's time for perhaps not science to talk and for something else to lead our culture. Yeah, no, I agree. But science, you see, that's like excluding a child from from the conversation if you exclude science. Science as a child needs to be there. You, I don't think I don't think that's what we're saying, Stefan. I think uh, oh, it's going oh, a good. bit extreme, yeah. but uh, I think the point is that this, this, um, you know, what you were referring to earlier, I would just refer to that. That you know, there's a whole philosophical tradition, the best of the tradition around science, and I think that has that needs to be reclaimed, and what you're thank doing. You, and uh, thank you, Manish. Uh, thank you, thank you. That's what I'm saying. Thank you very much. I'm and the way to reclaim it might be and to be more conversations like this with people. Uh, that's exactly. that's what I would invite. Exactly, you. Manish. That's it. Bravo. Well done. Now we tied the th the the, the racky thread. <laughs> can you summarize that, that, that again? Done. Can you well done, can you that summarize great. that again, Manish? How you tied it together? <laughs> no, no. I'm saying that 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 Stefan was basically talking about wisdom and philosophy. And I think the idea, the need is now to reclaim that within those traditions, within science and re-highlight those. And that these kinds of conversations might be very integral to that, that kind of right. process. And yeah. throwing out. Manish, that's brilliant. You've, we've just demonstrated what we're talking about, you see. That's really, well done, really yes, beautiful. I get to tie Iraqi on you, Stefan, now. Now we're brothers. Well, okay, you and I are tied by Iraqi thread. What an honor yeah. for me. Thank you, Manish. Yeah, Henry, uh, yeah, Henry wants to... Let's take a few questions, Henry. Elena. Yeah, Henry, yeah. let's have a few questions. Yeah, we before have we very go. little time left for questions, unfortunately. Okay. We do have some good questions. One okay, good. Uh, is from Roshni in Portugal. And she asks, how can we evolve the English language to expand beyond individualism? I'm going to add to that, and what is the role of economic localization in that? Wow. It's changing our language to more collective, you know. Um, I think oh, personally it's about just even not referring to our own selves as eyes, to refer them to as us or us too, um, encompassing more than just the individual. And it's about thinking, not what I need, but what maybe my community needs. Um, what's missing at the moment in my sphere and not my individual want in this current moment, but something that is beyond that. Well, I would also say what I said earlier, the importance of experiential knowledge. And I could see us bringing back that humility about things that we haven't experienced. It also relates to thinking that we know people we've never met because we hear about people in the media and and uh, people are both demonized and held up as great, wonderful heroes, you know, people we know really nothing about. So part of it is, you know, paying attention to the limits of our knowledge, which relates back also to the discussion about science. Um, so a science that proceeds much more cautiously, much more humbly, that is truly dependent on testing hypotheses in a reliable way always unfunded from giant corporations yes yeah exactly so that, i'm with you 100 so percent. that's so exactly think, the kind of yeah. science we i think that's all related to the language question too yeah mm, Manish, do you want to say i something? would just say one thing is you know um that one is you know again the 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 need to you know uh, reclaim our local languages and ling linguistic diversity around the world is very important because i see more and more like in india English has taken a has taken a undue hierarchy uh, in terms of not not only as a uh, as a kind of superior language, 
uh, and uh, I think that the need to do that is is has to be part of you know spaces. And the other thing is for us also to uh, really reclaim our uh, multi linguistic heritages. I think this whole push towards monoculture of language is really really dangerous. I think you know very I'm very my again my grandmother and grandfather who are villagers who never went to school more languages than me. So, yeah. you know, I thought they're way more intelligent than me. And yet I'm walking around with this educated label. So a time to give that up and really embrace how do we, how do we, you know, we have capacity to speak many languages, not only with the words, but through our bodies and with the land and so many things uh, with the ancestors. So how can we, how can we really bring that to the center, I think is very mm -hmm. essential. And that, of course, is completely related to localization because it is that decentralization that would allow for this pluriverse or this multipolar world where not this one dominant English language and this one worldview is imposed yeah. across the globe. So we have just another few minutes. I would suggest maybe if you have any parting comments, uh, that you want to share well, with us before we leave? I, I think there's a really great question here that would be a, a good framing for parting comments. May I read it? Please do. Uh, so how do we have these deep conversations with others without getting so intense that they pull back? Is it on me to say something to make sure they're okay with the depth and vulnerability that comes up when I get going on a topic? Or should I just trust that by being myself and speaking truly, it is a chance for both of us to learn how we can connect deeply? What is the etiquette? My simple answer would be yeah. just do it. Walk through the world the way you want the world to be. And maybe we don't talk so much, you know, because I've noticed from my own experience that actually it's how it's what I do in the world that actually ripples out and makes change. It's not what I say. Stefan, do you want to say something? Yeah, no, um, I think language is incredibly important. I was just thinking, how can we enrich the English language then from, you know, these beautiful languages of India that I used to hear when I was in India or the beautiful sounds of the Aboriginal languages. How do we bring that into English? You know, that's my question. How, how do we do it? I don't know, but I think it's something we need to do to bring the in, indigenous into English, I think is a major work we have to work on. How do we do it? I don't know, but I think it's a lovely project to think about. My name is. Um, yeah, I think uh, to that, that question that was raised, I think, you know, the time is uh, both to speak uh, with your full heart and uh, whatever full clarity you have is the time the world needs it. And also with, um, when I say full heart, I also mean um, full love. So being uh, honest with yourself, but you know, I, I, uh, I've had to unlearn a little bit of my, you know, um, Harvard debating, win the debate kind of mindset. And I think that's not the the way to go forward. I, I mean, we can speak very clearly. I just make it a point to remind myself that um, at the end of every conversation to tell the person we may disagree, but I still love you, respect you, uh, and see you as a, as a very important being in this world. And make sure to give them most important this Jaduki Jappi, which is the Indian magic hug. Uh, so that's the way to end every conversation. So the, the point of the conversation is not to win it once, but to keep the dialogue and the conversation alive so that you can keep talking and walking together. I would, I would completely agree with that. Yes, I think keeping that open-hearted, loving, compassionate, um, keeping your heart open is essential for the, you were asking about the etiquette. Mm -hmm. I think that's a prerequisite. And then you can speak forcefully and, and honestly, but, but if your heart is open, you'll also be listening and sensing when, 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 the, when on the, it's the other side has closed down. So you've got to be, there's that deep listening, which more and more people are also recognizing now that's necessary. Well, 
Yeah, we are running out of time. Yeah, okay. One last comment. Yeah. One. Just that I also, in this question, remind myself that we need each other if we're going to get out of this mess to, uh, that we've created. And so the right, the left, the up, the down, uh, all of us, we need each other and we need to collaborate. And and this is, I think, most critical in our own communities, how uh, these global ideological debates permeate and dis destroy and divide the communities. And I think that we need to really remind ourselves that the way forward is through collaboration and care. And, and that's how we how that's how we can shift the, and uh, change the game. And I would like to urge people wherever they are to try to build up a bit of a community group. Sometimes people talk in a circle of people around you with whom you share the journey of coming home. The, the journey, as I was saying earlier, requires that you be willing to be to be faulty, to be vulnerable, to be human, and that you connect more deeply with people around you in order to start sharing the caring, sharing the journey, which in the next few years is not going to be easy. The crises created by this globalizing techno-economic structure are multiple, as we know, and there will be more. But the other the other part that's being born and that is so much more alive than we realize. There's so much more happening at the grassroots than most people realize. It's small. It does not get into the mainstream media, but literally right where I live, there are things happening that are part of this localization movement that I haven't heard about. Just today, I learned about another small farmer's market that I hadn't I thought I had started all the farmers markets in this area. And then I suddenly find out there's another small one that's been going on for a few years. This is only 40 minutes away from me. So there's so much more happening that it's about rebuilding that fabric of deeply embedded, more indigenous community-based ways of living and that are rebuilding the more human culture that we evolved in not the culture of show off and competition and proving that you're important and that you have a, a, a car and a degree and so on that shows everybody how important you are. We are all longing to feel loved and, and seen and heard for who we really are, not our degrees, not our belonging. That is a universal human need. And the best way to experience, to meet that need and to help people experience that sense of being seen and heard is to connect more deeply with people where you live and you can be there for each other when the children need help, when there is illness, when there's crisis, but also to meet together to celebrate the music, the joy, the, the way that we have celebrated through our whole evolution together with people, a participatory culture, the dancing, the music, the chanting, all of it together as a group, not spectators lined up to watch a few stars, bring coming together to that inclusive culture. Anyway, thank you so, so much, dear friends, Stefan, Ella, and Manish. Thank you so much for joining us. And now we'll be moving into a, a call where we're discussing with our collaborators from around the world what's been going on during World Localization Day. And I hope the listeners will look, if you haven't seen the whole program, be sure you look at it, it's very rich. People in 30 countries, and uh, we have a mixture of, of conversations and pre-recorded things, as well as uh, one more live webinar tomorrow. Thank you. Oh no, don't do it. Thank you, Stefan. Wonderful. <laughs>